So this is the, the talk uh, on uh, Advisor. So we're gonna be talking mostly about uh, container sandboxing um, and kind of the security uh, threat model a little bit about with, with regard to containers. And some of our like kind of uh, thought process when building Gvisor uh, around you know the architecture and that uh, how, what we were thinking and and why like other approaches uh, the the kind of benefits like uh, pros and cons of each approach um, as we were kind of building Gvisor. So uh, just to, like as an introduction, I'm uh, my name's Ian Lewis. I'm a developer advocate at Google. Um, and a uh, kind of part-time contributor to Gvisor and uh, other kind of container runtime run related stuff. Um, so when thinking about kind of sandboxing, like the, like normal containers are kind of a great way to run applications, uh, but aren't always a great way to kind of sandbox them to run uh, untrusted code. So like in a lot of cases, like you might have code that is, uh, that you wanna run, but you don't want to actually you know, expose that, uh, your infrastructure to that code. So that might be something like uh, you're running code that users upload to your service. So something like a software as a service or some sort of like serverless uh, situation running third-party code, so like you have a vendor that provides you with a binary and you just need to run that in your cluster, uh, but like you don't know what's in that binary, you don't know like, uh, you know, if it's safe, and you don't know like what sort of vulnerabilities might be in it. Um, another is to like, you know, running kind of code on complex user input, so things that, you know, these, these are all, in this case, it's like something that might have uh, is more likely to have vulnerabilities. So things that take, you know, user input from that's untrusted and then does something complicated on it. So like that might be uh, something like um, video encoding or uh, image encoding or like machine learning, that type of thing. Uh, or you might just have some code that you wrote yourself and like you don't trust your own abilities. Uh, so, uh, or you know to keep it uh, safe and secure, and so you want to just sandbox that that code and make sure that it's um, uh, that it's safe to run in your cluster. So as I said, some of the use cases for like actual like kind of business use cases might be something like SaaS or serverless, um, you know, video image transcoding, uh, machine learning. Um, these are some pretty typical uh, use cases. But you know, as I mentioned, like it could be just running third-party vendor code or that sort of thing. So, like, kind of to break down, like, what, like, why we need a sandbox and like what, like, uh, the uh, the attack surface looks like when you're running something in a container. Like, so here's our application, and this application, like, is not trusted. This is just an application that could run any type of arbitrary code. Um, so it can and and may run code that uh, we don't expect it to run or that it may, you know, it could be completely malicious. Um, and so what applications typically do kind of as they're running is they, you know, on a Linux kernel or as part of uh, inside of a container is they, when they need to have access to resources, uh, they'll typically make a syscall to the, the Linux kernel. And so as the application's running on the CPU, like part of that, it hits this like call to the Linux kernel, which then does a context switch into the Linux kernel. You know, it writes some some code to, or some data to memory, uh, and then does a context switch to the Linux kernel, which then reads that memory and executes some sort of system call. And so, in this case, we're like opening a file, right? But then, like typically, as part of that, after that context switch, the the host kernel will actually run and do something. So like this is actually running host kernel code in a privileged mode. Um, and so if there's say a bug in the Linux kernel or in a in the, the host OS, like you could get potentially remote uh, or get arbitrary code ex uh, execution uh, that is with all of the privileges that the kernel itself has. Uh, and so this is something that we don't really want to do. You know, so like as part of the normal running of the application, 
it's actually calling into the Linux kernel and running some, uh, some code as the Linux kernel. And so this is typically the code that is kind of suspect in terms of like being privileged uh, and that you know if there's a bug in it could be uh, potentially problematic uh, in terms of like the security of the overall infrastructure. So this is why we need, we need things like container sandboxes. So like you know there's a lot of other projects out there. Gvisor is one of them, but you know there's Kata containers. Uh, there's like you know things like Firecracker. There's like Rust VMM. There's like you know all of these things that are kind of building sandboxes uh, for containers or at least for container-like things. Um, and so these are basically built to be able to run arbitrary code so that people can't attack from or escape from the the environment uh, that you know the container environment. Uh, and this code is like, you know, as I said, like completely untrusted. So we don't want to, you know, it could be doing anything. It could be 100% malicious code like uh, that. And we have to kind of assume that that's what it is um, because, you know, the application inside could be, could have been compromised in some way. So the goal of like sandbox isolation is typically to, you know, reduce the attack, the attack surface. Uh, and by, you know, the, Part of doing that is like reducing the the execution of trusted like privileged code in the in the kernel itself. So this is typically done through like some sort of virtualization uh, or abstraction of these hosts of the host itself. So you might do something like you know have like a, a virtual machine that abstracts the host or abstracts away you know the hardware, um, or you might have some other like level of virtual layer of virtualization. So you basically create like this virtual host that like if it gets compromised uh, doesn't expose the entire host or the entire infrastructure uh, to the attacker. Um, but as part of like this, like at least as we're building Gvisor and, and one of the principles that, that Google itself has, has uh, had when it builds uh, systems in order to sandbox things is to, per to have two layers of isolation. So like one of the, the idea here is that we don't want to expose the, the infrastructure to any one single bug. Uh, and this is, um, typically you don't want to have like a single bug uh, being, uh, have a sing, be a single bug away from having, uh, being able to get at things like user data or something that's, uh, that's you know, important to you. Um, and the reason for this is, just that you know, if you have a, you may ha maybe having a single bug is not all of that all that common, uh, but it's you know almost virtually unheard of to have like two bugs that that work at the exact same time uh, in order to you know that the attacker has has access to uh, in order to get like out of a particular you know a sandbox or a, a runtime environment. This just like makes it, you know, by having, by requiring that they have like two layers there, or they get past two layers in order to get to user data or to uh, something on the host, this greatly reduces, uh, or at least we think that it greatly reduces the, uh, the chances that somebody would be able to break out of the sandbox. So as we were thinking about building things like Gvisor um, and the, uh, and a sandbox, like we, there's, you know, a lot of different alternatives to building sandboxes. So one of those is, you know, obviously like running container, just running containers normally and running the code inside of a container is an option. Uh, but, you know, as we said with the being one like kind of kernel bug away from uh, people breaking out, this is typically not something that we really want to be able to be doing. Um, because containers are just basically running directly on the host. And so like any bug in any one of the, the, the interfaces that it's exposed to or that it has access to uh, could uh, potentially be a way of breaking out of the container. And a lot of applications typically need to have like, you know, access to a good number of syscalls or, um, so, you know, some of the examples like Dirty Cow are examples where you know, the, the bug is in something like mAdvise, which is like needed by pretty much every application out there. 
so you can't really just filter the syscalls in order to, uh, to sandbox the application. Another idea is like using unikernels. Um, unikernels are a way of kind of creating sandboxes, and typically they do that with like by kind of linking in or building an application with a guest OS as a, built as a library, um, and then running that in a hypervisor or in a in a locked down kernel or in a locked down uh, container. So this is this is like an interesting idea. Um, but one of the things that's kind of difficult with this is that like you can't really bring your own container in the most in most cases. So like, you know, containers and unikernels are are interesting, but like they have a lot of kind of downsides um, in the sense that containers obviously like aren't good for security isolation. Uh, they only have one layer of isolation, and it's it's hard to reduce the attack surface by just using a container or the the features that you're allowed that you're that are available to containers, so things like set comp or app app armor. Um, and, but unikernels are, are a way of helping with some of that, but they can't. You don't. You're not allowed to kind of like bring your own container. Like you kind of have to build a specially crafted kind of container uh, that contains the the operating system. So you have to bring a lot of that operating system level like support with you in as part of the container. Um, so that's. Not totally ideal because you have to have like a, a different build process. Like a lot of cases, like you have to have. There's a lot of limitations to the type of applications that you can run. Um, but you know that's so that's one of the reasons why you know we think that a different approach is is a is the way to go. Um, virtual machines are probably the the most well understood and most used way of kind of sandboxing things uh, or sandboxing applications. Virtual machines give you kind of, you know, a guest OS. Typically, you bring the whole, like, kind of uh, VM image, so uh, a guest OS and the application together. But then you have like the an isolation layer at the hypervisor label layer, which gives you like a pretty strong boundary between you and the host. Um, you know, typically, like, you know, depending on whether you're using something like a type one or type two virtual machine, you know, something that has hardware support or something that, or a, a hardware, um, yeah, basically a hardware support for the hypervisor, like, or not, kind of depends on whether you have like, you know, kind of one or two layers of, of security. Uh, but the, typically this gives you a reasonably good level of security. You know, you have a fairly, like with say like type two, you have, a hypervisor that's built into the kernel, and the the VM is run as a as a uh, as a regular process on the machine, uh, and this gives you a pretty decent like kind of single layer of boundary, um, but you're still kind of like one bug, say, in the hypervisor away from, you know, potentially having a full host compromise. With type ones, you kind of get you know you could be in the situation where you'd have to get like kind of a hypervisor bug plus like have some sort of hardware issue in order to break out. Like if you had like say, like memory fencing or whatever, like this is maybe a little bit better or, or this is a little bit better perhaps like, but virtual machines have a lot of other kind of downsides in a sense that like there, it's not easy to have like flexible resource usage with a, with a VM. Uh, so you don't get to kind of you have to uh, assign full sets of memory or CPU kind of to the sandbox. Um, and then you kind of have to just allocate that completely to the, to the sandbox. I mean, you can do some sort of overcommitting and stuff like that, but it's not very flexible. You can do memory ballooning, but like typically like you have to have kind of cooperation with the, uh, the OS inside the sandbox um, that may or may not be trusted or may not be trusted. And so you don't really necessarily want to have to do that. Um, you also want to have quick startup time. So depending on the environment, like if you're using kind of one of the micro VM things, you can get better startup time. But if you need to support a lot of devices or something like that, that can like increase the, the startup time. Another thing that we wanted to do as part of GVisor was to like have something that would integrate well with container-like solutions. So something that was very container-like, uh, but um, would actually give us a sandbox. So this is something that you know, would easily integrate in something like Kubernetes and give people a very container-like experience. 
in terms of like how they assign and and uh, manage the resources of the containers, but um, would also provide kind of a sandbox. So you wouldn't have like this like totally different paradigm for your sandboxes versus not. So we thought about it like a lot of this, like how how would we kind of build a system that would give us all of the things that we wanted. Uh, so, you know, with virtual machines, you have like kind of a hardware virtualization layer, uh, but and as I said, like if you when you, in order to like actually do a to build a, a uh, sandbox, typically you would virtualize the the system layers, right? So here, like you're actually virtualizing the hardware and providing an interface at that layer, and everything above that layer is is untrusted. But with with GVisor, the way that we kind of figured that we would do it is by virtualizing the OS, the uh, virtualizing at the OS level. So in this case, we're actually virtualizing something, virtualizing the OS, and then you know basically only the application. Well, like. I'll talk a little bit about that, but like, you know, people can basically bring their untrusted application and we can run that in a sandbox. Um, so the virtualized, uh, the virtualized OS is like, is trusted, but like at least up until the point that the application is actually run. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. So this like for us, like gives us the two layers of isolation that we want, uh, because as when we uh, actually boot up the, uh, the the container, uh, we have control of the OS, so we can set it up so that the the guest OS is running uh, and is the guest OS that we expect it to be, um, and then put like a, a fairly strong layer of isolation at the the host kernel level. So what this is uh, doing is it is basically intercepting kind of application syscalls and then handling those as part of a user space kernel. And then that, that, entire, that entire kind of package or sandbox runs inside of, the, uh, inside of user space and then needs only to make limited, uh, a limited amount of syscalls in order to implement the sandbox uh, to the actual host. And so by, by doing that, we reduce the kind of the amount of syscalls and you know, specifically the type of, we get to control a little bit more the uh, the actual um, arguments and things like that that are sent to the syscalls. So this gives us the two layers of isolation. Uh, it uses kind of the same you know principle of virtualization as things like VMs, but it is doing it at kind of a different level. It's doing it at like an OS level rather than at a hardware level. Um, and this reduces the host attack service by you know, reducing the amount of, of syscalls that are handled by the actual host kernel. And, you know, handling, like, the, the syscalls that are actually sent to the, the host kernel are, you know, managed by at least the first layer of, of isolation, which is the, the user space uh, sentry. So you would have to kind of break out of the user space, or uh, you would have to find a bug in the, the sentry itself and get over that layer before you could actually even send any arbitrary syscalls to the kernel. And then you're, only, you're limited to which syscalls you can actually run. And that's like a, a vastly reduced set than a normal application needs to run. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about like the actual architecture of the, of the sandbox and like how it kind of starts up and um, how that actually makes uh, a, a container secure. Uh, so the way that we integrate with Kubernetes is we use containerd, um, and containerd uh, provides a, an API uh, that um, allows you to run something called a shim, which will then uh, run an actual container. And containerd implements uh, the CRI interface that uh, Kubernetes needs in order to run containers. So it's very similar to the way that containers run, like we're, like normal containers run. Containerd will execute the containerd uh, a shim for, for run C in order to run regular containers, and this runs in a very similar way uh, to that. Um, but we can provide what's called a runtime handler through Kubernetes uh, on, 
to container D in order to tell it which runtimes to actually use. So in this case, we're, like, we're going to use run SC and we're going to run a container. Um, and so the first thing that the, do that the container does or that, uh, that GVisor will do is it will set up uh, our kind of sandbox environment. And we call this part the sandbox, this part that's like in the dashed lines here. Um, and that's where the application itself is going to run. But at this point, we, we still have, we have kind of a trusted sandbox in the sense that we're not running any untrusted code yet. Uh, we have a sentry that we know is like, is the actual sentry that we, uh, or user space kernel that we expect it to be. And then we have this, uh, we set up something called a gopher, which is going to do a lot of our file IO. I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, and then we are going to use either ptrace or KVM, uh, what we call platforms, in order to intercept the syscall. And then once we've done that, we like put both, we uh, encapsulate both of the sandbox and the gopher in a in set comp and uh, or a set comp uh, sandbox and uh, namespaces. Um, so we run these in like a fairly restricted actual container. And then we actually run the application itself. And so the application itself, once it starts running, can start making syscalls to the sentry. And at this point, we, we consider the entire sandbox untrusted. So we can think of the sandbox itself as being potentially compromised at this point because we're running untrusted code. So the idea here is to handle most of the, the syscalls like entirely within the sandbox. Um, and in the, the cases where we actually do need to use host resources, we can, the sentry does, uh, does some level of filtering and making sure that the, the syscalls that get made to the kernel itself are not uh, malicious or going to be problematic in any way. And then we can do things like, you know, we can run multiple containers inside of the sandbox. Um, so this is how we implement pods within Kubernetes. So you can have a single sandbox per pod and then have multiple containers running inside of that sandbox. Um, and then these are, these are kind of namespaced uh, you know, there's, there's different, like, uh, there's slightly specific namespace support within, within GVisor, but essentially they're namespaced kind of in a similar way to what you would expect uh, from, from a pod. Um, and then, so you get a very similar experience to the way that containers run. Um, you can assign them all the same IP address. You can, they can talk to each other on localhost, that sort of thing you get a very kind of similar experience to a normal container. So talking about some of the design principles behind GVisor, um, one is that we have these two security layers. Um, and then, so part of that is just the fact that we have the sentry and then we have a, a set comp sandbox so to give us two layers of isolation there between Linux, the Linux kernel syscalls. But also with, with things like file operations, we go through like a separate application outside, which is called a gopher, in order to you know, separate things like being able to open files. So like if you, if you want to open, say, like an arbitrary file, you would need to uh, break through the sentry and then find another bug within the gopher in order to actually start opening and writing to files that you uh, wouldn't normally be able to write to. Uh, so that provides our kind of two layers of isolation for, say, like file system writing. And then, you know, some other design principles are like that we have like, we provide minimal access to the host. So like no syscalls are actually passed through. So it's not like a set comp sandbox. It's actually like the, the syscalls that are made to the host are actually done as part of the implementation of the sandbox. Um, and then we limit the, the number of syscalls allowed. Uh, so instead of you know, having something like 200 for like the kind of default Docker uh, setcom profile, you have something like 30 that you can run with GVisor. Uh, and then we run GVisor itself or the, the sandbox itself in user mode uh, so that you know, even if the sandbox is compromised, we don't have like root access on the host. 
Um, we also use, we also implement the sandbox or the, we implement the Sentry and other parts of GVisor in Go. And the reason we do this is like so that we don't have like, you know, a lot of the, the problems that you would have if you write applications in C or kernels in C um, in terms of like buffer overruns and like, you know, there's, you know, essentially, a, you know, array length checking and things like that built into the language. So it's, it's memory safe um, and you have all the, a lot of the, these kind of security features built into the language. Uh, you know, other things like unsafe code reviews and like, you know, um, the fact that the, that it's statically linked so that we don't have like issues with like, you know, people overwriting like a dynamically linked library, that sort of thing. Uh, so these are, these are kind of like some of the design principles that we like build into the actual uh, um, development of GVisor. And then we use like a lot of the, uh, you know, the built-in like host uh, features like C groups and namespaces and to root or pivot root in our case um, and um, running the actual sandbox as the, uh, the UI, UID and GID of nobody so that we don't have like the, the user doesn't have uh, escalated privileges or privileges that it doesn't need um, and we drop like you know pretty much all the capabilities for the sandbox because they can most of those can be implemented by the sandbox itself. So as part of the sandbox, like as we're, you know, starting it up, the sandbox itself, like, is, you know, encapsulated in a C group in order to make sure that the sandbox doesn't use um, resources, you know, more resources or, or take up too many resources on the host. Uh, we encapsulate that in namespaces. So this is very similar to, like, the, the sandbox itself is, is, you know, very similar to, like, an actual container, uh, but it's a very restricted container in the sense that you know, we, we are fixed to running as a UID and GUID of nobody, and we have a uh, fairly restricted SATCOM profile. And uh, so what we do is like, as we're building up the sand, we're creating a sandbox, we set the like namespaces and to root or, you know, pivot root in order to, uh, to root the sandbox into a particular you know, directory, which basically contains nothing except for run as C. So like the sandbox itself contains like almost no file system at all. And then the, uh, we basically drop all the capabilities and set the user ID and GID to nobody. And then we put in a restricted set count profile that only allows the running of about 30 or so syscalls, 30 to 40, I think. And then we have, for file operations, because the sandbox can't really do any file operations like opening a file, uh, we have to do, we do that through a separate uh, process called the gopher. The gopher has a similar kind of experience except for it actually has access to a file, the file system that the, the container, that's used by the container. So this is also run in a C group uh, and has reduced a uh, set of namespaces, is to rooted to the actual, or pivot rooted to the actual uh, file system um, and the file systems that are needed for the container are mounted in. And then this also has reduced comp capabilities and has like uh, a fairly restricted set comp profile. So this can actually do a little bit more than the sandbox can because it can actually open files and things like that on the, the machine. But it has a fairly restricted set uh, of things that it can do so that we can, even if you are somehow able to exploit a bug in the gopher that you're not able to like you know, hopefully not able to break out of the, uh, the, the gopher itself. So th some things to think about, like, about, like, what's not protected. So, like, the sandbox can do only do so much in terms of what it's going to actually do. Uh, and so we have to be aware of things like, particularly when we're using Kubernetes, that uh, a lot of the things that Kubernetes, the defaults that Kubernetes uses are optimized for ease of use and not security. Um, same thing goes with Docker. So, like, Docker allows things like raw sockets, for instance, by default as part of its default set of capabilities. Um, so these are things that you kind of have to keep in mind. Uh, and, you know, in, in the fact, in the case of like raw sockets, we're actually like as part of GVisor, not really allowing you to, to have access to raw sockets. But like the idea is that, you know, the, uh, 
Kubernetes gives you a lot of defaults that are not necessarily uh, meant to be secure. And so you have to have, keep that in mind when you actually run a pod. Um, you need to keep things like you know, memory and disk limits uh, for, um, for the actual application. Run C will set, up that, set that up for a sandbox if you provide it to OCI. Uh, but you need to make sure that those are there in case the sandbox decides to uh, try to use up all the memory on the host, for instance. Other things like network and disk isolation, like you know, network access uh, is something that you need to uh, be aware of. Um, because for pods, you're, they're given an IP address and they're on the pod network, so you need to be able to use things. You need to use things like network policy or some other net, like mechanism to limit what the the sandbox can do on that network. Um, things like arbitrary packet injection, like I said, like raw sockets, uh, the centrally provides isolation here uh, in the sense that it runs inside of the sandbox, but the sandbox itself has access to to write uh, to write arbitrary packets, and so. If somebody is able to take control of the sandbox or the, of the sentry itself, they can write arbitrary packets on the network, and so you need to be kind of aware of that. Uh, another thing is file rights and permissions. Like, um, you know, if people can like write to the root file system on your container, for instance, they could potentially overwrite files or executables that get executed, and so you can have uh, some vulnerabilities in that sense. So, like. You know, it's ideal to use things like read-only file systems for the uh, the base root file system uh, and things that you don't expect to change within the, the container. Um, also, GVisor doesn't really have a built-in throttling mechanism, so you need to use things like C groups or rely on the host in order to do that. So I'm going to try to wrap up here, but um, you know, GVisor itself is you know something that is very container-like, and we we are kind of trying to make it as close to uh, the kind of container experience as, you, as possible and integrate that really well with Kubernetes. So currently we have the, the ability to use runtime class in Kubernetes to specify GVisor as a runtime class and then have that go to container D uh, and run containers as part, as G, in GVisor. Uh, we have things like a Minikube add-on that allows you to kind of try out GVisor and play with it a little bit uh, easier than having to set up your, a whole Kubernetes cluster yourself. Uh, so give that a try. Um, we also have things like, you know, on, on Google Cloud, we have GKE Sandbox, which allows you to uh, use GVisor, get GVisor support kind of out of the box there. <coughs> and as part of all this, or in order to support all this, we're building this, uh, the, we're working on the GVisor container D shim to, um, you know, and this works, we're, we're maintaining this uh, in order to provide container D support for uh, running uh, GVisor sandboxes. Um, so GVisor is an open source project. Uh, we have a website at gvisor.dev, and you can uh, check out the code on the on GitHub. Um, we have a, a um, Gitter community for the uh, to to chat about GVisor and to you know, for GVisor development or usage if you have questions. And we also have a couple of mailing lists uh, that we use for uh, folks who are doing development on GVisor and, uh, and for GVisor users to like kind of ask questions and um, find out more and interact with the, uh, the development teams, the, the folks that are working on GVisor. So I have like basically one minute, but like, um, what I can, I will maybe show you a little bit about like what it looks like in a particular, uh, for a particular, um, to install that and have it running in Kubernetes. Actually, I think I'll probably just give up on that. Um, <laughs> it's like I got disconnected. But um, in any case, like you can essentially use like the runtime class. Like what I wanted to show was like like using a runtime class as part of the pod. But it's essentially just putting this this field in there. 
and you get mostly the same sort of experience as a regular container. Like you can do things like exec into the container, view the logs, like all of that sort of stuff. Uh, so that's really what I wanted to show you there. So anyway, I think I'll finish up there since I'm kind of out of time. Uh, but if you have any questions, I'll be around here. Um, and I have some stickers if you want stickers. Um, so yeah, and we also have Kevin from the development team uh, here to uh, help answer questions if you guys uh, have any. So thanks a lot.